And uh, with what we witness here tonight and what we've heard and what we're learning, the only way that our grandchildren will enjoy the same legacy that was left to us is if we do what the last speaker uh, talked about. We absolutely have to stand up, be counted, organize, mobilize, and fill rooms like this over and over and over again so that we are able to popularize what's happening. And I think by and large, uh, society has been completely taken in by the corporate, uh, you know, as we know as BS, the propaganda, the marketing, the, um, the bombardment of advertisements we hear 24-7. And we heard the Premier talking about it being, you know, clean, clean energy, clean industry. And we know that that, that is absolutely not the truth. The, um, I think we need to be absolutely visible. We have to be heard, we have to be loud, we have to be proud, we have to be out in the streets. And I know it's a challenge to give up your time. I was um, at a funeral of a, a very young person in Osulius just a few days ago. And uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, Chief Clarence Louie has been the chief there for 20, 30 years. And uh, he talked about the, the responsibilities of leadership. And he talked about what he described as leadership time. And he said, leadership time is not nine to five, it's not five days a week. Leadership time is when you contribute your own personal time to a cause, whatever that cause may be. And in this case, it's being able to educate the general public about the absolute horror story of LNG. Coming here tonight and, and seeing some of those presentations it never occurred to me that it is far, far worse than Enbridge and Kinder Morgan. I think that we have been lulled into thinking if we win those battles, that we'll have won the war. But I would suggest, based on what we witnessed, that um, the LNG is the real enemy in everything that it represents. The Union of BC Indian Chiefs is um, mandated by resolution when our chiefs come together in assembly. And as of late, our leaders, and we represent over half of the First Nations in the province, our organization is growing in proportion to the threats to the homelands of our constituent communities and the failure on the part of the government of Canada to be able to do anything that other than hollow rhetoric and promises, we've been mandated to organize and to, um, to uh, look toward a rally, a march. We were looking at, at June the 7th. Uh, there's some discussion that should be pushed over to the 9th. For those of you that have been following these issues, there's been three forums throughout the province on LNG. The last one was in Fort Nelson a few weeks ago. And I had the, uh, the honor and the opportunity to, to be there. And I can tell you it was life changing for me. And it was heartbreaking. Because like yourselves, I've heard about the devastation to the homelands of Treaty 8. But we had the opportunity to to go up in a chopper and go over the, the basins. And it took uh, a few hours, and it was absolutely heartbreaking. There's no other way to describe it, to, to actually see it, to see how devastating it is to the landscape and how it's completely fractured the land. And I'm told at nighttime, the lights of the gas plants and the wells 
it looks like um, the lower mainland. <coughs> And when you see it like that, it just, it's so hard to talk about. I desperately, the, all that time we're up in the air, I look for a moose or a deer or some sign of wildlife and I didn't see anything. <clears throat> so it's the northeast, the economy of this province is being built on the destruction of the northeast. And the pipelines that are being contemplated by LNG will further destroy the North. And we have a social responsibility as, as human beings, as, as grandparents and parents, to lend our support to Treaty 8, to all of the people in the North that are fighting so valiantly to push back this agenda. And I think that um, we're making progress. I absolutely know that to be the case. We had the dubious opportunity, I suppose, to meet with the new Minister of Natural Resources earlier today, this afternoon. We met in the very same room that we met former Minister Joe Oliver. And I described that meeting as absolutely bizarre when that happened about a year ago. And he just simply repeated speaking points. There was no dialogue, there was no serious discussion of the issues at hand. And today we sat across from Minister Rickford and we heard the same rhetoric, the same speaking points, the same arrogance, the same condescending manner that, that uh, we should wake up, we should smarten up, and no one understand that the government of Canada knows best, yeah. and that we should go along with this agenda. And it was a very tense, adversarial uh, meeting that we had today. So there's absolutely no um, way that they're even going to look at the Iford report and the 30 odd recommendations in that report, which would require substantive investments to bring about those uh, recommended uh, interventions. They're not about to do that. They're looking for a shortcut to be able to get through the constitutional and legal minefield of the rights of the First Nations in this province. And, uh, I had the sense that they're under tremendous pressure because I believe that, that uh, both Canada and British Columbia are falling behind with respect to the international market situation and, um, you know, um, Premier Clark's bogus notions of prosperity vis-a-vis uh, -vis LNG, I think was uh, a gimmick, it was an election gimmick, and it was bogus from day one. And I think that... Uh, <laughs> the news we heard today with respect to the Russian-Chinese uh, arrangement with natural gas exports is going to uh, present a very embarrassing challenge for the Premier <laughs> to be able to try and assure the, the markets and potential investors that, that BC somehow is still in this race. Because I don't believe that that, that is the case, but nonetheless, um, we know that we'll continue to fight these battles until such time as we have governments in place with uh, a national and provincial vision that speaks to the interests of the people who have made their homes in this beautiful province, who have invested generations of their families' lives in building, building a livelihood in tourism and, and, and everything that speaks to the, the natural values and beauty of this province. And uh, up till now, with these governments, 
we've been catering to outside interests, corporate interests, mm -hmm. and the interests of the, you know, the genuine British Columbians are being ignored and sacrificed. So we have to mobilize, this has to become a popular struggle. And I just want to close off by thanking each and every one of you for coming out tonight and so generously sharing of your time and hearing from our learned panel here. I, um, I just want to also end by um, acknowledging the Treaty 8 uh, chiefs who have demonstrated incredible leadership over the last um, decade or two with respect to this fight against oil and gas, against Site C. And, um, you know, without question, I've fallen in love with um, Treaty 8 territory, with the elders in Treaty 8. And, and uh, when you get to that point of falling in love, <laughs> uh, you know, you will be there at their side when the rubber hits the road. So again, I thank everyone for coming out.